Hi everyone, my name is Nico Murillo for those who don't know me and I am the chair of Texans for Safe Access and I'm so excited to have two women with me today, Dr. Olga and, doc and pharmacist Darina Doce. And I'm so excited to bring this topic to y'all about opioids and veterans that use cannabis to help combat some of their issues. So I want to introduce the two ladies today. And first, I want to bring um, on the ladies so you can see their faces and I will introduce them. Here we have Dr. Olga Obi mm -hmm. and Dr. Darina Doce. So uh, Dr. Olga is a native Houstonian board certified emergency physician board certified eligible lifestyle medicine coach, practicing cannabinologist and a Texas state certified compassionate use doctor. She works with patients across the United States to refine their health with cutting edge lifestyle changes and a tincture of cannabis in legal states. Dr. Olga believes cannabis is an important and promising medical plant and enjoys educating anyone who will listen uh, Dr. Olga is on TSA's board as our board physician educator and leads us in medical outreach and education. So welcome, Dr. Olga, and thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Darina Doce, and she is a Nebraska licensed pharmacist with 17 years of wide varieties of expertise in the field of pharmacy. She is also a ret retired major from the U.S. Army with nearly nine years of service. She has a wealth of knowledge in the field of clinical pharmacy, pain and psychiatric medicine, focusing on the warrior army, uh, the army warrior transition unit soldiers. During her service, she endured a major back injury that manifested into chronic pain, migraines, and a lieu of ailments related to her injury like depression, insomnia, and anxiety. Knowing how quickly she would become dependent on opioids, giving her chronic conditions and the combination of medications she was on, she refused the standards opioids as a treatment option and became interested as in medical cannabis benefits. Since retirement from the U.S. Army in 2017, she has devoted her time and efforts to educate and enlighten the medical community with the vast benefits of cannabis to change the stigma associated with the plant. And during her spare time, she likes to garden, cook, and spend time with her family in San Antonio. So welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for being here with me today. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, so um, Dr. Darina, can you um, tell us what opioids are? What opioids are? Well, um, they are a class of different drugs, of course. There's a combination of things. It could be uh, painkillers. It could be stimulants. Uh, to give you examples, a few that you are familiar with, things like oxycodone. It's uh, probably one of the most popular and arguably one of the most controversial drug in recent history. Um, it's a good painkiller, but highly addictive, of course. Hydrocodone, for example, according to the, F to the DEA, um, it's uh, the most regularly diverted and abused drugs. And fun fact, Americans actually use 99% of the world supply of hydrocodone, according to 2014. Other opiates, uh, we have morphine, um, heroin, codeine, fentanyl, hydromorphone, the list goes on. Um, that's what they are. They are highly addictive. If we focus on the painkillers, for example, the oxycodones, morphines, codeines, those are to be used for pain, whether it's acute or chronic, um, for either palliative, end of life care, of course, um, active cancer treatment. And sometimes they use them off label for things like cough or uh, musculoskeletal pain. That's not actually a typical medication that you're, you're supposed to start with, but we see that. And also for um, heart attacks, like we we see a lot of that in the emergency room. So that's what opiates are. And if we focus on the painkillers, because those are tend to be the leading path to addictions because related to pain. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and so, Dr. Olga, do you believe that cannabis is a gateway drug? This is an excellent question because it's not a matter of belief. So first, what we have to um, understand is that the definition of a gateway drug is a drug that leads you or is likely to lead you to use addictive illicit substances. It itself is not the addictive drug. It basically means it's going to cause you to use something else illegal or illicit or addictive. And so by that definition alone, we can safely say that there should not be belief or not belief. The concrete fact is this, 
Um, if a person is going to use something illicit, something bad, something wrong, then that has to do with a psychological propensity or a psychological likelihood um, separate from the use of any other substance. Um, and then we also have to understand where the term gateway drug came from. It came from, um, I think it was the Reagan, Reagan administration where um, Dr. DuPont during that administration kind of coined it. He, and he had no intention of coining it, um, but he coined it so that families and parents could um, rest assured that they knew how to, to track if their young one was going to fall into the hands of addictive drugs. And so what he um, uh, defined as a gateway drug was not meant to include marijuana at all. Furthermore, furthermore um, marijuana itself has a very low addictive um, profile. Um, even though gateway drugs don't have to primarily be addictive, marijuana in that sense is unlikely to lead to other addictive substance uses. And finally, we actually are learning from lots of research um, that uh, marijuana is actually considered more of an exit drug. Um, this is why we're starting to use it for things like addiction recovery, things like reducing cravings and, um, and to help patients get off of certain medications that they no longer want to be on because marijuana helps to uncouple or unlink the uh, likelihood of becoming addictive, uh, addicted to something which as it relates to your cravings or your withdrawal symptoms. Um, and finally, Marijuana is actually the most, one of the largest used um, illicit substances in the world. Um, and as a result, if it were a gateway drug, we would also see the direct correlation between its use and more people across the world using illicit drugs. Well, um, I wanted to just kind of overall make sure that everyone understands that we don't, we no longer need to use terms like belief especially when we're talking about cannabis or medical marijuana, um, and especially when, where it comes to gateway drugs. We are able to, one, debunk the term gateway drug um, by uh, breaking it down as to what it actually means. And then two, kind of understand that the way that marijuana works um, is, is, is to actually help with the symptoms that would allow somebody to develop an addiction or to develop a propensity to use another illicit drug. Marijuana does not do that. And um, a lot of research is showing that. And so we don't need to say that um, marijuana is believed to be a gateway drug. It's actually proven um, factually that it is not um, a gateway drug based off the definition of gateway drug. Perfect, I loved that. Um, so uh, Dr. Doce, are, there, are opioids damaging my organs if I'm using them? So they actually don't just cause, you know, damage to your organ. Of course, they're deadly. Um, what we commonly see, first of all, if we come on to a site where there is a patient um, that is suffering from opiate, um, usually they have respiratory depression. That is usually the leading cause of death in those patients. Um, HIV and hepatitis due to the use of infected needles and also their risky behaviors. Uh, we also see liver damage, strokes related also to the injection site, um, heart lining um, infected also due to contaminated needles or the crushed pills are also contaminated. Patients also tend to develop hyperalgesia, um, which is a syndrome of increased sensitivity to pain. It's also associated with psychomotor impairments where it affects, um, it slows the patients overall, so it affects their gait and their loss of coordination. We also see endocrinopathy, um, which often manifests into um, as androgen um, deficiency and hypergonadism, and that's basically diminishing the sex hormone. So those symptoms sh would range from anywhere from decreased libido, fatigue, to loss of muscle mass, um, erectile dysfunction in men and, and also um, irregular uh, period with women, and also leading to osteoporosis with long-term use. Um, um, opioid overdose um, can also result in acute and eventually leading to chronic kidney disorders. And that's all related to the dehydration and causing, <clears throat> excuse me, low blood pressure combined with um, muscle damage or rhabdomyalgia, basically. Um, they also see, we see urinary retention. That prolonged use causes an accumulation of the metabolites in the patient's kidney, which leads to toxicity and also kidney failure. 
Another thing is reduced the blood, the, that reduced blood flow related to the reduced breathing that happens with opiate use because that affects your breathing. Um, and also the low blood pressure actually uh, related to, to the kidney damage causes less oxygen to reach the brain, which eventually causes brain cell death. Um, and we also see weakness in the immune system. They're prone to infection and other diseases and collapsed veins. Um, and of course, constipation. But when you're mentioning the other major issues, constipation probably is not an issue at that point. I mean, is that all? Because that just sounds... Uh, that um, sounds the list honestly goes on and on, but I'm just... And Dr. Olga can probably tell you because she see it firsthand in, in the AR. Wow. 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 Um, and so, um, Dr. Doche, can you tell me what the risk factors are for like veteran um, dependency, what those si warning signs would be for addiction? So veterans happen to be at a higher risk. Just being that, you know, you have to remember they are at least two to three more, two to three times more likely to develop dependency than an average individual. We, what has also happened is that we're able to construct trauma patients better compared to patients that survived World War One and Two. Well, that reconstruction comes with debilitating pain and behavioral health problems. Also, life expectancy has been greatly expanded and what comes with age is also pain. So the veterans population also tends to have other diseases and disorders that will worsen the pain and changes their response mechanism to pain. Um, they also suffer from other disorders that put them at a higher risk to seek relief, like PTSD, anxiety, insomnia, drinking alcohol. As a matter of fact, Harvard Medical School published an article on the connection between pain, anxiety, and depression. And people suffering from depression, for example, tend to experience more severe and long lasting pain than other people. Mm. Depression also increases your sensitivity and threshold to pain. Now looking at the uh, veterans populations, they are a high risk group who already suffer from severe and prolonged injuries. And I like to think of pain like wine, it, it ages well and it becomes stronger and worse with time. Well, wine doesn't get worse with time, but pain does get worse with time. One of the problems we see is that clinicians fail to treat the inflammation that comes with pain and also address the source of, in, of the injury properly, which they just give the patients quickly medication, you know, um, opiates to send them home for quick relief. But that causes a problem in the long run because um, the American Journal of Psychiatry actually published, um, I believe, stated in 2018 that it takes about four weeks to get become addicted to opiates. So when you're dealing with chronic patient users of opiates for legit pain, you're already you know, putting them at a risk of develop, de developing that dependency. Also, long-term use for more than six months of painkillers causes depression. So now we see there's a correlation between pain, depression, other issues, and that's where uh, veterans fall into that cycle, unfortunately. Now, of course, also because they're on other medications, um, like the stuff for their depression or other psychiatric problems, that can cause drug-drug interaction that could put them at a risk for death or opiate dependency that actually increases their risks. Things to watch out for change in physical appearance. You know, are they not taking care of themselves? Are they wearing inappropriate or dirty clothes? Are they lacking of interest? Are they irritable? Um, a sudden mood swings, change in energy, you know, are they one moment really high energy and then they're really depressed? We need to watch out for these things. Are they socially isolating themselves? Are they having problems with work or relationship or school? Um, also, are they getting uh, engaging themselves in, in risky behaviors like gambling or spending more money or are they asking you for more money? Um, also, excessive use of alcohol is, is a big problem, one, because of the drug interactions that can kill your liver. Two, it's another sedative that basically you do, you're amplifying the effect of the opiates and their effect. And also now we're developing another substance addiction, which is alcohol. And if they're stopping to take their medications, 
that's also a, a warning sign. And are they becoming defensive when you ask them, hey, are you um, using anything? Those are things to watch out for. So, um, Dr. Olga, my um, what if my doctor has reduced my pain medications, but I'm still in excessive pain? Um, what are what are some things that I can do? This is a great question. Um, so first, I would have to talk to this particular patient. If a patient is not on medical cannabis, but they live in a state where they are allowed to take it, um, I usually recommend that they take a fairly high ratioed dose of CBD. What does that mean? CBD to THC, excuse me. What does that mean? You're going to take probably a one to one, one part to one part CBD and THC medical marijuana, medical cannabis, or medical hemp. Um, and you're going to take it with your pain, pre-existing pain medication. If that's tramadol, hydrocodone, oxycodone, gabapentin, or Lyrica, you're going to take it with that. Um, if you specifically take opiates, which is what we're talking about today, um, I would recommend that you start taking a low dose. A low dose is about two milligrams of CBD and two milligrams of THC for example, with your every opioid dose. So if you take it three times a day, you're going to take medical marijuana with it three times a day. And then um, if you're still in pain after you've incorporated or added medical marijuana to your opiate, what you're going to do is slowly increase that opiate, um, that medical marijuana dose every um, two hours up to every two days, depending on when you need the relief. Some patients are still in excruciating pain and um, when I'm talking about the previous doses, I'm talking about an oral um, preparation. That's an oral, I mean, an oil or a capsule. Um, if you need faster relief, then that's when I do recommend that you take an inhaled form, and that would be an aerosolized or vaporized form. And again, you're going to start with the low dose. So that's one puff that lasts two to three seconds. You're going to hold, and then you're going to release out the vaporized air. And again, that's with every opiate dose. When you take inhaled, it's quick on and quick off. So you can expect that you might have to redose in about 45 minutes to an hour, but it's really just to see what your dose is going to be of medical marijuana. So I'm gonna give an example because I said a lot. So let's say that you're taking hydrocodone, 10 milligrams slash 325, three time, uh, excuse me, four times a day, um, as needed for your pain. And realistically, you're taking it four times a day. You're still in pain. What you're going to do is take a one-to-one -one CBD to THC formula after you consult with your cannabinologist. And you're going to take that dose with every dose of your hydrocodone. If you're still not feeling relief. You're going to consult with your cannabinologist to have a rescue inhaler. You're going to take that inhaled form, even though you took your medical marijuana, you're gonna take one slow puff with your opiate do dose four times a day. And that's generally what I tell my patients that are severe pain. These are my um, terminal cancer patients, my MS patients, um, patients that have severe um, unrelenting migraines that ended up on opiates somehow, um, or, or some, some version of my sickle cell patients that have severe pain. Um, chronically. These are the instructions that I would give them. I always, always, always recommend that you consult with a cannabinologist or cannabinoid pharmacist because you do need to go over your medications with them to make sure that they don't interact. But once you're cleared, that is the recommendation that I give. Dr. Dustin Sulak has an excellent um, website that really kind of helps patients um, outline how they should do their marijuana, medical marijuana with opiates. And that's on healer.com, H-E-A-L-E-R.com. Um, and if you ever need help, you can always email me and I'll walk you through how to use that website um, so that you can get relief. And realistically, about 50 to 80% of um, um, your opiate dose, dose can be reduced on medical marijuana. But more importantly, it's somewhere about 81 to 97 percent of cannabis users, medical marijuana users, receive relief with opiate medications. So if you're not receiving a relief, it's probably because you need a little bit more guidance. And it's it, and, and, and in that case, a cannabinologist or a cannabinoid pharmacist can help you. Perfect. Thank you for that, Dr. Olga. So now that I can hear, y'all can both hear me. Um, 
I, I could give both of y'all's feedback on both of these questions. Um, we can start with you, Dr. Olga. Can medical cannabis replace opioids for chronic pain? And, um, and will it help with opioid recovery or uh, dependency? So the short answer is yes. Um, basically, medical marijuana um, or cannabis is very synonymous to our own endocannabinoid system. And our endocannabinoid system has in place um, its own opiate response system. Uh, that's not a coincidence. And so, um, and medical marijuana or medical cannabis does act on that favorably. And so there are pro and anti systems that are there kind of turning each other on like light switches um, that have to do with our CB1 and CB2 receptors primarily. Uh, the CB2 receptors, for example, um, will act on our opioid um, centers or endorphin centers um, to help uh, increase the effect uh, the opiate-like effect that we get from using cannabis. Um, it uh, in turn will also increase the effect that you get from using an opiate. Um, and so absolutely uh, medical cannabis can one, be a co-treatment uh, with opiates, but two, since it has its own activity on those centers can be a replacement for many patients for uh, that are suffering with both acute and chronic pain. Acute pain being like if you broke your bone and chronic pain being like if you have cancer. Um, there are studies that have shown that um, uh, greater than 97% of patients strongly agreed that they were able to decrease their opiate um, consumption by more than half after using cannabis. And 81% of that same subset um, or same group of people said that they were able to get rid of opiates altogether and wow. strongly agreed that medical cannabis completely worked to uh, replace their opiate uh, therapy in chronic pain. Um, so into your question, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, Dr. Darina, what are your thoughts? My thoughts, um, similar to Dr. Olga as well, it, cannabis is very effective in treating inflammation and, and also pain, of course. And it provides pain equivalent, uh, pain relief that's equivalent to Tylenol 3. So if you're somebody that is on Tylenol 3, or, you know, the effect of that, that's the kind of response you're going to get. Um, as a matter of fact, the first reported use of medical cannabis was by the Chinese emperor about 5,000 years ago, where they used cannabis for medical marijuana, actually for uh, the treatment of gout and rheumatism, malaria, and oddly enough, poor memory. But if you think about it, gout and rheumatism, for example, those are very painful um, inflammatory, inf inflammatory diseases. And what's funny is that they were making tea. We, we don't know what kind of tea they were making. Were they making it in water? So if they were making it in water, they weren't getting the, CB, the THC effect because you need some kind of fatty substance to pull that THC from the fibers. So we don't know if, how they were using it, but we do know that it was very successful and effective and over the years, we've it's been well documented by the Egyptians, by the Aramaics, by the Persians, how, how it works. Cannab um, cannabinoids tend to have a high therapeutic index, meaning we can go up in the dose without seeing, uh, without having side effects. So you're still safe when you elevate the dose. Now, the other thing, there was a... Um, double-blinded uh, randomized study that was done by the American Journal of Psychiatry that actually just got published in November of 2019, where they um, had three different groups. One group had the acute um, uh, administration. They gave them uh, CBD for 24 hours. Another group, they gave them short term of only three days. And then another group where they used it on seven, for seven days, and they stopped. And then we wanted to see how did the patients do seven days later. And those patients who were addicted to, to heroin at that point, um, and they noticed that when they were given the doses in 400 to 800 milligrams, the, the patients, um, their drug cues, uh, which are like the cravings, you usually have like cues that makes you craves, you know, for um, cravings for like opiates or the substance that you're addicted to. They noticed that their stress level and anxiety had gone down after they stopped the CBD. And also that that actually lasted for a week after they stopped the CBD. So the patients didn't have the craving. They stopped craving, though, you know, their typical substance. And it also 
it lasted for seven days. So those are things we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with these kind of patients that, that this is promising. Wow. Also, yeah, so, and also the acute CBD administration actually in contrast with the placebo re significantly reduced both the craving and anxiety. And to me, this is huge because whenever you're dealing with somebody who's overcoming an addiction or trying to get themselves off, off of a substance, they tend to be very hypersensitive to pain and anxieties and other mm -hmm. you know, psychological effects with that. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you um, for that. And so, uh, Dr. Olga, when can I expect for the pain to stop and the cannabis to start working? That's a um, very good question. So it, it does depend on the way that you're taking the medical marijuana or medical cannabis. Um, if you're going to be taking it as an inhaled form or sublingual form, you can expect to feel the effects of the medication um, within, um, depends on the person, but generally within 20 to 30 minutes after your dose. If you're going to be taking it orally or as a suppository, then you can expect to uh, feel the effects of the medical cannabis about anywhere from 90 minutes um, for some patients. Um, and it can be up to uh, two and a half hours later. Um, uh, medical cannabis is not yet available in the injected or IV form. And so we don't have any data on that, obviously. Um, and so if you are taking medical cannabis with opiates as an additional treatment, um, the general uh, effect of your opiates, however long it takes to, for that to come on, you want to add on that time uh, it's going to take for your medical cannabis to start to act. And then you can expect to start to feel some relief in that window. So again, if it's inhaled or aerosolized, that's about 20 to 30 minutes afterwards. Whereas if it's oral or rectal or vaginal, that's about um, 90 minutes to two and a half hours after you, you take your dose. Okay. Um, now, long-term, so a lot of patients ask me this question because they're still feeling pain every, every single day. And pain is a horrible thing to feel. So long-term, you can really expect to feel therapeutic relief or find your sweet spot in about two weeks. If you're not feeling relief in two weeks and you've added on medical cannabis, it could be that your genetics are not allowing you to utilize the cannabis, or it could be that you're not dosing appropriately, um, and or it could be the product itself. And so you really want to make sure that you consult with a cannabinologist or cannabinoid um, pharmacist so that they can guide you if you're not feeling the therapeutic relief um, within two weeks. Awesome. Okay. And um, so Dr. Darina, should I stop all my other opioids once I start cannabis? Oh my God. So how are you going to stop your other opiates is the first question I'm going to be asking. Because you should never, ever attempt to withdraw yourself, you know, by, on your own. It is, um, literally a life-threatening event because your body will go through extreme changes that are deadly. Um, also that painful and unpleasant physical symptoms of withdrawal can usually is what puts people back into that cycle wanting to use the drugs again. So being um, physically clean from substance doesn't stop the physical aspects of addiction also and craving, which is a, you know, that's the big problem with it now. Do dosing chronic pain patients who are already taken other medications, um, like let's say if they're taking op um, morphine or oxycodone, um, those same drugs are actually metabolized by the same enzymes that the cannabis is metabolizing. So, and the the most commonly ones are the CYP three A four and two D six. Those are the common ones. Now, cannabis also happen to be metabolized and also inhibits those enzymes, especially when we are dealing with the chronic pain patients. We're probably going to be pushing that cannabis dose a little high, and when we're dosing pushing the dose high, we're going to be inhibiting the, these enzymes. So what happens because of that inhibition, you're going to have that same dose morphine that you were taken before. Now that dose is actually going to start to accumulate and floats around your body. Mm -hmm. So your doctor is going to need to bring your dose down. That's the very important thing. So you don't want to have an accumulation because that accumulation is toxic at that point. And this is where cannabis is going to be very helpful in getting you off of your other medications that you're going to be using less and less of it. Plus, because it's going to help you with the craving, um, 
it's that's how you're going to get off, um, off of your uh, painkillers, basically. Also, that inhibition, if the clinicians are listening and they're worried about that, that, that liver inhibition or enzyme inhibition, that's time and dose dependent. So if you're worried too much, usually we tell patients, you know, doctors and patients, get off of your cannabis for a couple of days. Um, let your system comes back or reduce the dose. That's all you have to do, really. Just reduce the dose and your body will get used to it um, with time. Perfect. Okay, um, we just have one more question. And um, and so, um, Dr. Olga, I know this one could be a little bit taboo, but what if my child's taking opioids? Should I consider giving them cannabis instead if I'm in a legal state? If you're in a legal state, first I wanna send out a message that I always do at the beginning of all of my consultations. Parents, be empowered. You are your child's doctor, okay? Um, and I say that to say, you absolutely know what's best for your child. You share their genetics, you share their heart, you share their tears, you know their pain, you're up with them all night, you know better than we do. With that being said, I strongly urge you to consult with um, someone that is uh, well-versed in pediatric cannabinology. That is absolutely a cannabinoid pharmacist. That is also your uh, pediatric neurologist or neuropsychiatrist. And then of course your pediatrician that um, may be registered within your state. Um, I do believe that medical marijuana is potentially safe for most children, depending on their age and their own endocannabinoid system. I do absolutely believe it's safer than chronic opioids, um, but it is something that is a delicate um, balance, like Dr. Uh, Doche was uh, explaining. The balance is delicate mostly because of the withdrawals that you can expect that your child will experience, um, but also because we're going to be going into a new um, medication, medical cannabis that you may not be used to seeing your child on. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, one, kudos, two, be empowered, but three, absolutely, that is something that needs to be guided um, by at least one session, if not more than one. Right, that's awesome. All right, ladies. Well, that's all I have. Um, I, is there anything else you want to add before um, we sign off? I would like to actually direct a message to the patients and also the doctors, the, the clinicians, not just the doctors, clinicians. It could be doctors, pharmacists, nurses, whoever. Um, we are. This is a new wave, and a lot of doctors still don't believe in the medical efficacy and the therapeutic effect of cannabis. Um, I will. I like to encourage all of them to be open-minded and start reading and get educated, because whether you like it or not, your patients are going to be taking it. Um, the statistics are telling us that everybody. <laughs> At least a third of the Americans are using cannabis somehow, some way. In order to understand what's going on with your patients, you need to have that open mind um, level to where you can communicate with your patient. Your patient will be honest with you so you can see the best result possible of your therapeutic interventions with your patients, whether it's for pain or for other stuff. But unless you start reading and accept that your patients are going to be on it, um, you probably are not getting an honest discussion with your patients. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. Um, Dr. Olga, do you have anything to add before I sign off? Ditto. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Doche, yes. Well, thank y'all both so much for being here with me, and I'm excited for our next topic. So um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off from y'all, but thank y'all again so much. And. And here I am. And so I just want to thank everyone here that has joined our community today for listening in on this important topic of opioids and how we can address them as a community. Um, they are a plague that are is crippling our nation. As many of y'all know, 22 veterans are dying a day and um, opioids are very destructive on our society. So I'm really excited uh, to open up this topic with all of you. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great weekend and goodbye.